Good afternoon. I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm happy that all of you have come to hear me talk about the saga pattern. I'm going to introduce the saga pattern by talking about what motivated me to start looking into it, learning about it, give you a brief history of the saga pattern, although I'm no expert on it, and talk about how to use the saga pattern to help you deal with uh, undoing side effects and asynchronous uh, computations. So starting with a little bit about me, I am a developer at Outpay Systems. This uh, little graphic was made by one of my coworkers yesterday just, uh, just for us. Um, I've been developing for about 20 years or so now. I have, uh, I really enjoy programming a lot. I've been doing a lot of functional programming these past, uh, I don't know, five, six years. And I've been doing a lot of Scala, Clojure, and C++. So this story begins for me about, at the end of last year, I was doing a contract at uh, Monsanto, and we were creating microservices to help developers create microservices. And, and you know, there's all, some good things that came out of this. For example, there's a, an open source library that we started working on uh, to give you a nice idiomatic Scala API for, to AWS. So if, if you're, you're using AWS and using Scala, you know, please check it out. But getting back to microservices, creating microservices, as a result of you know, what it is that we're trying to do, we're interacting with AWS. We have a lot of sequential operations. You know, we have an operation that we need to do, wait for its return, then we do something else, wait for its return. And sometimes you know, everything works great, sometimes it doesn't. So to give you kind of a small example of what this might look like is that we're going to create an encryption key pair using AWS KMS. And we want to do a key pair with an alias because when you create a key and you get the metadata back, the only way that you can identify it is through a UUID. And this is a really hostile way to know about what keys you have. So you can create an alias that gives you a less hostile way of knowing about them. And if everything works great, you get a 200 and voila, you have a key with an alias uh, on AWS. And this code could look like a little bit like this. Uh, you have a function that will create the key. It's asynchronous, so it returns a future that has a metadata that comes back from AWS. You have another function that you give it the key ID and the alias. And because AWS doesn't give us anything, we don't really return anything either. And if you're familiar with, with, um, with Scala, there we can compose these two features together very easily using this for uh, comprehension. So what this is doing is saying, okay, go create this key. And when it comes back, you know, we're going to put that value in key. And then we're going to go and create the alias using the value that we, we've realized. And we don't really care about the return value here because it's, it's nothing anyway. And finally, we can yield, you know, we can put our key and alias together and hand that back to the person that invoked us. And it's pretty concise, it's very nice, but what happens when things go wrong? I mean, if create key goes wrong, well, it blows up, so we never get a key, so we never try to create an alias, so we never return anything. Um, I mean, it's not ideal, but it happens. Uh, but, you know, no, no big loss. However, what if the second operation fails? You know, create alias fails, so it doesn't return successfully, we don't return a successful value, but what about that key that's sitting out on KMS? I mean, it's now orphaned. We don't know about it because we don't have that, that key context. We, don't, we never got that UID in our application. It's just sitting out there, and we have to wait for someone to manually go in and clean those up once they get the email from Amazon telling them they can't create any more keys. So the, fundamentally, the problem that we have is that we have a sequential operation. You know, operation one, operation two depends on operation one, and in an ideal world, they all work just fine, but sometimes they fail. And in the first case, if it fails, no big deal, 
but in a certain case, there's something we want to do in the case of it fails. We want to be able to delete the key. And ideally, we want to, we want to codify this whole graph, this whole operation that, well, if create alias fails, we want to delete the key. And so how do we do that? I mean, we can do that. There's, there's nothing that keeps us from doing that. Uh, for example, if in addition to create key and create alias, now we have a delete key. Well, uh, now we can you know, create, or create key that can handle this. So now, because we're doing something a little bit different, we can't use that nice four sugar. So we create a key, we flat map onto it, we get the key, use that to create the alias, and then we map the key with the alias. Up until now, this code right here is exactly what that four uh, construct was doing at the very beginning, but this is what it like, expands out to. But now we're gonna do something extra. In this case, we know that you know, the create key succeeded, but the recovery or, or the create alias did not. And so now we can actually recover. If there was an exception thrown thus far in, in our, our futures, we can you know, get that key or get that exception, you know, delete the key, and finally you know, kind of report to the function that invoked us or the application that invoked us, you know, it failed. But at least this time, we clean up after ourselves. And so, I mean, obviously, we, you, know, you can program this. And this is a simple two-step operation. But you know, what if it's you know, three steps or four steps or even more? I mean, we were certainly dealing with a lot more than just four simple operations. And so this is, and this is something that doesn't really scale. I mean, it's not specific to being asynchronous. I mean, this happens if you're doing completely synchronous stuff as well. You know, to really handle all these resource leaks, you have to do like nested try catch finalies, and your code gets really, really nasty after a while. Um, I mean, if you're dealing in a, in a language that kind of gives you macros that can handle this, or if you're using, I guess, like closable to somehow manage these sorts of things, maybe you might be able to, to make things more pleasant to use. But the, the fundamental problem is that our concurrency frameworks don't have this functionality built in. They give you the tools to be able to build it, um, but it's not easy to do. And it's, you, you, know, you might make an error. You might forget to undo an operation. So is there a way that we can create a library that can handle all of this safely? And, um, and the pattern that we see here is essentially is, is that we have these couplings that you know, there's an action and there's a reversing action. So what if instead of having a graph that looks like this, where we have, you know, I haven't counted how many ways that you can go through that graph. Um, but what if we can make it look something more like this, where each node in the graph knows that if something fails further on down the line, I know how to clean up after myself. So, you know, can we do this? And so this is a problem that we, we came across, you know, last November, last December, I had been thinking about it. And earlier in the year, I was talking to a former coworker at a conference, and he uh, suggested that I watch this video um, of a talk, I think, at GoToConf last year by uh, Carrie McCaffrey. I hope I have that name right. Katie. Katie McCaffrey, thank you. Um, she had talked about using the Saga pattern at Microsoft. Um, there, she worked on video games. She worked with Halo, and, and they had a distributed system where um, you know, players, after playing a game, send up their statistics, and they have to be stored and persisted up there, and things sometimes fail. Uh, this is in, um, and, and so he suggested I, the, that I look into this, and so I did. So 30 years ago, 1987, uh, about 30 years ago, this paper was published out of Princeton University that talked about long-lived transactions. And the problem here is that um, you would have transactions that take a very long time to complete, either because they simply were doing a lot of work, or maybe they're waiting on input from other systems or from users. And because these are transactions in a database, I mean, they're holding on to locks, onto resources, which means that anything that it was locked 
you know, it had its hands on it. It says, this is mine, you can't have it. Anyone else who tries to come in and try to do some work, it would say, no, it's mine, you can't have it, go away. And this was causing a performance problem. Um, you know, you're, and the proposed solution to this is like, well, okay, these transactions, maybe they don't really have to be transactional. Maybe we can break them up. Um, you know, if, if we want to give, away, give up some of the guarantees of having a long-lived database transaction, and we can bundle it up into smaller packages, that each one of these is a database transaction. Each one of these is completely transactional and has all the asset properties and all that. But between them, other things can happen. So we are definitely lose, you know, isolation here. But we still want to, like, retain atomicity of some sort. And so they propose that for each one of these transactions, there's some sort of um, compensating transaction. So if something fails, you know, we can kind of somehow compensate for that, which doesn't necessarily mean reversing the thing, because maybe you did something that's irreversible, but maybe you can do something, send an apology. Sorry, I didn't really mean to do this. So the guarantee for atomicity here is that either all of these things will succeed, or if there's a partial success, you know, all the things that had succeeded will have their compensations run. So this is a way of, of trying to have some level of atomicity uh, without relying on the database to support it. Although they did suggest that the database should support Sagas. Uh, but in case your database system doesn't support Sagas, you know, they gave you some instructions on how you can implement this uh, using a separate process. So, how many of the, how many of you have seen like Begin Saga in your favorite database? Well, um, I'm not sure that this idea ever really took off. Again, I'm not an expert on this, uh, but someone someone can correct me if I'm wrong. But the idea didn't die. Um, about 15 years ago. You know, we're getting to, to an age of, you know, service-oriented architectures and microservices, and you know, we have all sorts of fun distributed systems. And we want transactions, but those don't really work well uh, in a distributed transaction. Um, the more complex you get, the even more complex it becomes. And so the question then becomes, well, how can we get some sort of transaction-likeness without actually doing, like, two-phase commits? And so the Saga pattern was, was, was kind of rediscovered and re-implemented not as a performance enhancement, but as a way of dealing with errors, with recovering from oops, uh, systems that can fail. And, um, and I think it's seen some success with this. There's, there's different talks out there. The one that I mentioned uh, earlier, there's also one that... Uh, uh, like Ronald Kuhn, I think that's the name. Uh, I think he's one of the Akka people uh, doing, um, uh, he's giving, been giving a talk on like reactive design patterns, and the Saga pattern is one of those. There he uses a persistent actor to implement a Saga. So I'm interested in doing asynchronous Saga. So I'm mostly interested in like, okay, I have some concurrency constructs in the language or library that I like to use, but I want to add some undo semantics in there. Um, so I'm not interested in persistence. So if my machine fails, if, you know, if my program fails or whatever, um, I'm not going to try to like restore state from some sort of persistent store. That's not the problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, also, what I'm dealing with doesn't necessarily have to be distributed. It, you know, it doesn't need to be. In my case, I guess it technically was, but I didn't think of it that way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do this using um, abstractly streams. So I did this using Akka streams, but uh, theoretically this could work with like Core Async or Go Routines or something else like that. So the primitives that we want to work with are we have our forward operation. This is the thing that we want to do. We get an input and something happens and we get an output. Now we also want to have the rollback. So what if we need to roll back that operation at some point later on? Well, 
we have a rollback operation. So that one takes the imp the, as an input the output that was generated by our forward routine, and we really don't care about the result of this. Um, and we're just executing this for side effects. We love side effects. Um, so how do you compose these two things together to, to create like one of, one of these things that knows about the forward and the reverse? I mean, you can't just put them together um, because you need to have some way of like, coordinating both the forward and the reverse side. And so the way I went about this is to have the forward taken a try, which is a algebraic data type that either can you know, have a success with a value or failure with an exception. And so you're going to be getting inputs that are either you know, valid inputs or exceptions, and you're going to output the same. On the other way around, you're going to essentially either going to get an exception or not. And the way this kind of is going to work in practice is that if you have a success, then you'll do your operation, and if you're successful, you'll pass it down. Eventually, if everything that's depending on you works just fine, you're going to get a none. And that means you don't have to do anything. You can just pass it back. Um, so that's great. Well, what happens when the world isn't happy? Which is, happens way too often. Well, if we have an exception that comes from downstream, we know that, well, we have to invoke our undo operation. And then once we've finished, we can pass this exception you know, back to anyone who we might be depending on. Well, what if we fail? Well, if we fail, we have our exception that we kind of pass forward, and eventually it comes back to us and we just pass it back. What if upstream had failed? Well, that means we're going to get a failure, and we just pass it around. It's pretty simple. So how do we do this? Well, we just have to do a little bit of wrapping of our forward uh, to handle the case of, well, first we have our try. Now, in our try, if it's a successful, then we're going to run this other kind of little graph that's going to run our forward operation. If it's successful, it's going to wrap that successful return value in a success. But in the case it wasn't, then we're going to recover it. We're going to get that exception, you know, package it in a failure, and pass it down. In the case that we had a failure to begin with, we repackage the failure so that it has a, you know, the correct type, and we pass it down. To do the rollback flow, it looks very similar. In this case, we have both the output from our forward operation in this tryout and the exception that came from downstream. The, and we, we have this just as a single argument, as a tuple. So in the case that we were successful, but upstream or downstream was unsuccessful, then we perform our rollback operation and kind of discard the result and get the, that exception back, and we pass it down. In any other case, so if we succeeded, then upstream will either have, um, you know, will have succeeded, or if we failed, then upstream will have failed, then there's nothing for us to do. We pass the exception back. And, you know, that's about it. Now we have the basic building blocks that we need to put together our, our stage. So the only thing that we're adding here is essentially that coordination mechanism between the upstream and the downstream. So we have our input that comes in. We run it through our wrapped forward that's either going to return, that's going to return some sort of try, and we're going to broadcast it. So broadcast just means that we're going to take that input value and make two copies of it and send it in two different directions. And we're using this as a, as a synchronization mechanism. So one, one copy is going to go downstream to anyone who depends on us, and the other one's going to come in to this zip function, which is essentially just the reverse. It's going to collect two values and produce one that contains the two of them. And so finally, when we do get that input, we'll send it to our rollback functionality, which you know, may or may not do something, depending on what these values are. And finally, we can return our, our, our output, our throwable. And you know, this kind of gives us that building block that we're looking for. Now you can essentially just stack one block on top of the other, so long as you know, the types match up, because we're using Scala and we have types. Um, 
But there's still one thing left here. I mean, what we have is essentially like this big pipe, but it's got a big leak on, the, on one side. And we have our inputs, but any inputs could go and it's going to fall off the other side. So we need to cap this pipe. And the way we do this is essentially by doing something similar to what we were doing in, um, in our individual stage, but now we do it for the whole flow. So here, uh, this, this stage that we have of the A and the A prime, I mean, it could be just one operation, it could be 100 operations, but from our standpoint, it looks the same. So the first thing that we do is we get a raw input, we have to wrap it in a success, because that's what our stages expect, and we execute. Eventually, we're going to get some sort of value out of that. So it could be a successful value, it could be an unsuccessful value. And what we're going to do is we're, gonna, again, we're going to use this broadcast and zip pattern to synchronize between like the output of the forward and the output of the, of the reverse. So in the case that it was a success, then we know that this operation succeeded and we can pass none down so that everyone else can just say, okay, I'm good. In the case that it was a failure, then we pass the exception back down and everyone can either just pass it along or do the rollback depending on their, on their individual state. Once, so that's what happens here. Finally, once that rollback operation uh, completes, now we have our two, our two things synchronizing together in zip width. And we're using a zip width here instead of zip because essentially we don't really care about the result from the rollbacks. We're just going to use the result from the forward operation and return that. And here, I opted to choose a, a returning a, a try with the output because since this is a stream, this allows us to do an indefinite number of values. You can just send in values all day, and they'll either succeed or fail. And um, whereas, but if you wanted to change this so that you only get a single value that either you know, throws an exception or drops bad values, that's trivial to add on uh, after this. So, there's, so this is very basic, and it doesn't really cover like, all the things that the Sagas paper talks about. You know, they talk about, well, forward recovery. What if you have um, save points so that, say, T3 has a save point attached, so that when it succeeds, anything that fails after that, it can restart from that point. And um, I don't have that coded into, into you know, the prototype in the library that I'm working on, but theoretically, that's something uh, that should be possible. Um, much more exciting to me, I think, is parallelization. You know, what if you can have a complex graph where you're doing all sorts of operations, some of them in parallel, but you can still have them all clean up after themselves? I think that's possible, uh, but I haven't gotten around to trying it yet. But it's not just for streams. I, I have done like, a little prototype with a future that is like a saga future. And, um, and it works, but I think it's a little bit harder to work with because of a few kind of constraints to the saga future. So futures are really nice because they are, you know, they, it's, it represents a computation, so it's like a monad over like a future computed value. But to do a saga future as a monad, now it's of a tuple of also your computation and the rollback uh, that you might need to evoke in the future. Um, so that makes it a little bit harder to implement, but, and it also makes it harder to make a really nice, clean API for it. But one of the big problems that I, that I think there is with futures is that because they don't live in an environment that has like that Saga execution manager or context, um, they're unaware of, of what context that they're running with. So if someone manages to reach in, you know, pierce your Saga feature and grab you know, the future inside, they can dereference it and use it, but it's possible that after they get that value, you know, that a rollback operation might have undone whatever that value had done to it. Uh, so that's a problem, and how do you create a present API with this? So it's certainly possible, and I'll probably get around to it at some point, but certainly don't let the fact that I did streams keep you from doing anything else. Also, in the case of Vaca streams, it's trivial to put a future in a stream, so uh, as a good mathematician, with futures, we just reduce it to a problem that's already been solved. So let's, now that we've talked about this, you know, what does this look like in practice? You know, let's go back to our, our original scenario. Uh, 
And so I've created here a number of flows to, to represent you know, like the simple operations, the primitives that we want to use. Uh, we can build these using the functions or the function signatures I showed you earlier. I'm not going to do that here just because of you know, time. But um, the one difference that we're going to see here is that because of the linear nature of this, like any input that's needed further downstream needs to be passed in from the front. So our key creator takes the alias as an argument, even though it doesn't use it. And it just passes it down to the next stage. So its input here is a string, and then outputs a string, a tuple of the string in the key metadata. The deleter, of course, has to take that tuple as its argument, even though it only uses the key metadata. Our alias creator you know, takes those inputs, uh, it maps nicely, and now because we've attached, you know, as a result of this operation, the alias is now part of that key metadata, we no longer need to return uh, that string anymore. We've consumed it, so it's not part of our type signature. And because we're doing sagas and we have to have both the forward and reverse operations, I have an alias deleter. So in my library, creating a saga flow is a lot, if you're familiar with Akka streams, there's like uh, bidirectional flows that you can create just from two flows. Well, saga flows works pretty much the same way. You just give it the forward flow and the reverse flow, and it gives you essentially your, your little stage. We do that with both the key and the alias. And finally, we can create our master flow that's going to do everything and clean up after itself. And it's really simple to build. We take our stage that builds the key, we stack the, st the stage that does the alias on top of it, and then we convert it to the flow that we want. Um, and we could add all sorts of other operations to this if we are so inclined. And so at this point, it's just a matter, you know, we have as, you know, in this case, as an Akka stream thing, we have essentially a representation of our computation that involves the rollbacks uh, that we can pass around and instantiate uh, whenever we will. So my conclusions from kind of looking into this is that sagas, I think, are a very useful way of thinking about error recovery and how you're going to do that. I mean, when you have a complex process, you know, how can we break it down into simpler steps that we can then manage? And most importantly, I think, for me, is that I can create libraries that will implement this so that later, so that gives me kind of better concurrency building blocks. I can build more robust, reliable systems with less work because I already spent a lot of time thinking about it up front and created a library I can reuse. And it's something that other people can reuse, um, but not quite yet. I mean, it, I have some work out there. It's still very raw. I need to, uh, uh, but eventually I will release a library and put it up on uh, Bintray or something. So that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your time.